everybody, welcome back to our second day of, whoop, of the meeting um, for the ISCP, ISPC. And um, today I'm really happy to introduce you to our second um, plenary speaker, which is the one that doesn't need introduction. Eric, can you start sharing your screen, please? Hello. Hi, Eric. Can, can you help us sharing your screen? So yeah. this is Eric Cherry. He is going to be our second um, plenary speaker. The title of his talk is on the nature of chemical bonding. Eric, you are going to have 50 minutes to speak, if that is OK with you. And I will let you know when you have a still uh, 10 minutes for the, for the end of your talk. Is that OK? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please, everybody, mute yourselves. Uh, we are broadcasting, and the floor is yours, Eric. OK, well, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to all the organizers. This has been a great meeting so far. Uh, let's hope um, it continues that way. Um, the first thing I need to say is a bit of a sad announcement, and that is that I would like to dedicate this lecture to Paul Humphreys, who some of you may know, philosopher of science, sometimes known as Mr. Emergence, who wrote a number of books on emergence and unfortunately passed away a couple of days ago. I learned of it through Statis Silos on, on Twitter, actually. Um, Paul Humphreys uh, was from the same, same part of, uh, of London as I was. In fact, we discovered at one meeting that he lived on the street that I walked along to get to school. And Andy McMillan, who's here, will, will know that street, Midhurst Road. Paul Humphreys lived there. He was at the University of Virginia for many years. My talk will consist of three sections. First of all, I'm gonna speak about what philosophers of chemistry have said about chemical bonding. Then I'm gonna do a section on textbook explanations of covalent bonding according to quantum mechanics. And the main part of the talk will be the modern view of chemical bonding and the role of kinetic energy, or the, if you like, the alleged role of kinetic energy in explaining chemical bonding. Okay, the first section. What have philosophers of chemistry so far written about chemical bonding? Robin Henry, who spoke yesterday, and hopefully is here, I haven't seen him yet, but hopefully is here, has talked about what he calls two views of chemical bonding, the structural view and the energetic view. And he mentioned this briefly yesterday. Very broadly, what the structural view is, is the belief that bonds actually exist between any given atoms in a molecule. Whereas the energetic view, due to quantum mechanics, is the view that there is chemical bonding, but not necessarily the existence of actual definite connections between specific atoms. So no actual bonds, but bonding. Michael Weisberg, at the same session of the PSA, Philosophy of Science Association meeting in 2007, gave a paper in response to Robin Henry in which he argued that the energetic view was somehow superior, that it represented a major challenge to the structural view. So according to Michael Weisberg, there are no actual chemical bonds, but of course there is bonding. The fact that there is bonding, nobody doubts, of course. Much more recently, 2022, Vanessa Seifert, um, formerly of the University of Bristol, now the University of Athens, argues that chemical bonding is real. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And she does this by appeal to some arguments that have been published by Daniel Dennett, who's a, a general philosopher. Um, these arguments have to do with patterns in nature. Now, let me go back to Robin's paper. Or rather, in the case of all three of these papers, the major concern appears to be whether chemical bonds are real or not. For instance, Robin says, 
Although the approximate solutions could be interpreted in terms of classical bonds, there was some question whether the bonds were projected into a chemical reality that is devoid of them, meaning, according to quantum mechanics, chemical bonds are devoid of reality, they're not real. He also says, moreover, in the mind of the organic chemist, the chemical bond is no mere abstraction. It is a definite physical reality, a something which binds atom to atom. So he's claiming, he's saying something very obvious that to the organic chemist, organic chemists tend to regard bonds as being real. He quotes from Pauling. Pauling once again defended resonance by its connection to classical structural theory. And the quotation is, bonds are theoretical constructs, idealizations, which have aided chemists. So perhaps a little surprisingly here, Pauling is also under the impression the, that bonds are actually constructs and not, not real. I must say I was surprised by that quotation because I would have thought Pauling being you know, a, a, a disciple of Lewis would have argued somehow for the, for the, rea anyway, for the reality of chemical bonds. It turns out he didn't. And that was one of the way he defended against criticisms against resonance. Now, Robin Hendry in that paper of 2007 seems to be agnostic in most of his articles as to which of the two views he prefers. However, I want to read the final sentence, the very final sentence of the article. While it, meaning the energetic view, has the advantage that it applies straightforwardly to all types of bonding and is clearly consistent with quantum mechanics, the cost of this view is the loss of what is plausible and intuitive in the structural bond. Radical revision of the classical conception of molecular structure implies explanatory loss. So for Robin, or many people presumably, there is a loss on adopting the structural view. There's an explanatory loss. We can't explain as much as we could otherwise. Now, I, I put it to, to Robin that maybe one can accept structure and also bonding, but without invoking actual bonds. Okay, so of course we want to talk about structure in chemistry, and Robin has, has, has written a lot about structure, but maybe we can continue to talk about structure without assuming that specific bonds, actual bonds exist. Also, Robin doesn't discuss the possibility that the existence of actual real bonds <clears throat> might be level specific. What I mean by that is that yes, organic chemists believe that bonds are real. Meanwhile, quantum chemists may believe that actual bonds are not real, even if bonding exists. Right? It doesn't have to be an across the board uh, decision on how to regard bonds, in other words, it may be level specific. The second paper I mentioned, let me just come back to briefly. This is um, Weisberg, in two, also in 2007, challenges to the structural conception of chemical bonding. And he concludes, the paper concludes that the key components of the structural conception are absent in all but the simplest quantum mechanical models of molecular structure, seriously challenging the conception's viability. To put it another way, according to quantum mechanics, only the simplest quantum mechanical models can be used to support a view that bonds are actually real. Most recently, Vanessa Seifert says this, there is persistent disagreement about whether bonds exist. This debate reached its peak when quantum chemistry emerged as a field, at that point, most chemists followed the traditional conception of bonds that was formed by Gilbert Lewis in 1916, who defined them as a pairwise relation among atoms. He explicitly stated that bonds exist, right? Lewis explicitly stated that bonds actually exist, proclaiming that in the mind of the organic chemist, the chemical bond is no mere abstraction. It is a definite physical reality 
as something that binds atom to atom. Right? So that's the, that's the structural view. That's the view that atoms actually exist. She continues, on the other hand, the development of molecular orbital approach in quantum chemistry some decades later led scientists such as Charles Coulson and Robert Mulliken to claim that bonds are artifacts. In Coulson's words, written in 1955, a bond does not exist. No one has ever seen it. No one ever can. It is a figment of our imagination. Right? It couldn't be clearer than that. Vanessa Seifert concludes that neither the structural view nor the energetic view provide a suitable characterization of chemical bonding. Right. And she told me this only a few days ago because she read the abstract for this talk and she got in touch to say that I had misrepresented something. So just to, just to clear the, the situation up. But she does seem to believe that chemical bonds are somehow real. So all three of them are concerned with the question of the reality or otherwise of chemical bonds. It's a major question in all of three of those papers. Now, as I see it, this debate that's been had among these philosophers of chemistry is a relic of the earlier days of quantum mechanics when Coulson, to repeat his quotation, wrote in 1955, a bond does not exist, no one has ever seen it, no one ever can, it's a figment of our own imagination. Chemists especially are no longer asking questions like, do bonds exist? Because I take it that chemists in particular would say something like, bonding appears to be real, right? Even if specific bonds as such may not be real. To merely ask whether bonds are real or not reduces the discussion to the form of yes or no. And frankly, nothing very interesting emerges from answering that question. You know, it's the, it's the end of the discussion in a sense. Surely the question ought to be, if, if we're gonna discuss whether they're real or not, we want to know the extent to which they're real. It's a little bit like the reduction question. Is chemistry reduced to physics? Well, it can be just a yes, no question, which is not very interesting. The real question is to what extent, if any, is. So similarly here. Now, Paul Needham, another philosophy of chemistry, has written, construing the status of the chemical bond as an issue of existence is perhaps an unfortunate formulation. He goes on, what exists are entities such as molecules, atoms, and electrons, whereas bonding is something they do. The question is how, how do protons and electrons result in bonding? Not whether bonding is real. In fact, Needham is the only philosopher of chemistry that I know of who has touched on the kinetic energy view of chemical bonding that I'm gonna go on to discuss in a moment. He touched on it in a very long and excellent paper in Studies in History and Philosophy of Science. To put it another way, never mind the question of whether bonds are real. A more interesting question to my mind may be to examine what bonds actually consist of. What is the mechanism that causes bonding through, through the means of protons and electrons? In 1927, as you all know, Heitler and London produced their quantum mechanical explanation of the covalent bond. This is now 95 years old this explanation. And yet there is much disagreement among chemists, not just philosophers now, there's much disagreement as I'm going to be saying as to the conceptual interpretation of the quantum mechanical account of the chemical bond. So what uh, Heitler and London may have done is to calculate the energy of the bond approximately, the bond length approximately, but not the interpretation there's a popular view among historians and philosophers of science that scientists are not very reflective about their work and it is our job to do the reflecting. For example, there is the view that quantum chemists are only interested in calculating properties. I put it to you that this is not the case. For example, 
The authors Feinberg et al. said the following in 1970, admittedly it's some time ago now, current progress towards better quantum cal uh, chemical calculations is leading to increasingly complex wave functions, making it more and more difficult to relate them to qualitative ideas about chemical binding. Thus a need arises for conceptual interpretations which are appropriate for such wave functions and at the same time allow for the development of a corresponding physical and chemical intuition. So at least these authors are interested in interpreting, not just calculating. Um, Nordholm and Bakske, much more recently, 2020, chemical bonding is undoubtedly a central concept in chemistry. While bond formation is arguably the most fundamental chemical process, its physical origin is still the subject of debate. Even today, when accurate quantitative electronic structure calculations of ever increasing accuracy and complexity have become widely available. They go on, seemingly there is a chasm between numerical and physical resolu resolutions of the chemical bond. It is our aim to provide the physical understanding of bonding and help connect the physical and numerical views of bonding. So Nordholm and Bakske certainly are interested in interpretation, not just calculation. Okay, let me move to the second part of my talk. I'm gonna briefly look at the usual textbook explanation of chemical bonding through quantum mechanics. I've drawn two hydrogen atoms here, and I've taken account of the fact that in quantum mechanics, of course, one regards the electron as much as a wave as it is a particle. So I've got these wavy lines around each of the nuclei of the two hydrogen atoms. And we're gonna bring these hydrogen atoms together to form an H2 molecule. Because we're dealing with waves, waves come together in the form of in-phase combination, constructive interference, out-of-phase combination, destructive interference. Here is the profile or a graph of a 1s orbital. In the case of hydrogen, this is a wave function magnitude being plotted against distance from nucleus, et cetera. You have a, the greatest value at the nucleus, which tails off. If we plot this on each side of the nucleus, it's symmetrical and we get a sort of peak like this. So here it is on both of the hydrogen atoms side by side. Now we bring them together. And as you know, we get two possibilities. The in-phase possibilities results in a buildup of electron density between the two nuclei. The out-of-phase contribution results in a depletion of electron density between the nuclei, which we call antibonding. All this should be familiar to people who know the um, quantum me mechanical account of chemical bonding. Here it is again, only this time I've accompanied it with a picture of the interpretation of this that is usually given in textbooks. The interpretation is in the case of the bonding orbital, as opposed to the antibonding, there is, as I said, a buildup of electron density. Sorry, I went the wrong way. And as a result, we can picture it as electrons, not necessarily two, but electrons are being piled up, are being concentrated between the two positives. And as a result, the two positive nuclei are attracted to each other, right? This explanation or the explanation lies in the buildup of electron density between the nuclei. And the idea that the electrons are acting as a kind of glue that attracts together the two nuclei. This is therefore an explanation that is essentially electrostatic, right? Positive, attracted by negative, attracted by the other positive. And it's an explanation that is to do with potential energy. Bond is explained through the role of potential energy, namely attractions between protons and electrons. And of course, the theory also takes account of the repulsions between the electrons and the repulsions between the protons. But still, it's essentially a static potential energy type explanation. 
of course, it is it has remained popular because it it meshes. It accords very well with the idea of bonding being a sharing of electrons between two nuclei. Uh, here's an even more uh, elementary, if you like, picture of the chemical bond. This explanation is found in nearly all general chemistry textbooks and in nearly all advanced physical chemistry textbooks. But it's incorrect, as many authors have pointed out, for several reasons. One, it completely ignores the role of kinetic energy of the particles concerned. The alleged attraction between the two nuclei resulting from this mechanism, it turns out, is actually outweighed by proton-proton repulsion. In other words, if it was really about the buildup of electron density between the two nuclei, that wouldn't be enough to overcome the repulsion between the two nuclei, right? which is a kind of a startling situation. Back to Nordholm and Backske. With respect to the basic physics of covalent bonding, a long-held and still widespread view is that chemical bonding is essentially an electrostatic phenomenon. Namely, the energy lowering that corresponds to bond formation is thought to be the result of the decrease in potential energy due to the attractive interaction between the nuclei and the electronic charge that is accumulated in the bond region. Now, I'm just repeating it for emphasis through the words of some of the people who have worked on this. This, they continue, this essentially classical and static picture of interacting charge distribution is appealing in its simplicity, since it appears to be a straightforward extension of the Lewis theory. In contrast to the electrostatic view, Hellman proposed that covalent bonding should be understood as being brought about by the lowering of the ground state kinetic energy associated with the delocalization of the motion of valence electrons between atoms in a molecule. For several decades, this kinetic energy view, the one proposed by Hellman, was ignored by most chemists. Nordholm and Backske are among the chemists who are trying to revive that view. Hellman, here are the dates that he lived. Hellman had a, a, a rather unfortunate life. He escaped Nazi Germany and went to Russia and had a, a very brief successful academic career published in Russian, and then was accused, would you believe, of being a German spy and was executed at the young age of about uh, 34, 35. Hellman's views were revived by one Klaus Rudenberg in the 1960s. Here's a picture of Klaus Rudenberg, who's still with us. In fact, he's still active, would you believe, at the age of 103. I move on to Richard Feynman, because Feynman is one of the people who has explored the nature of chemical bonding in many publications, including in the Feynman uh, lectures, the three volume Feynman lectures. And I, I'm going to mention Feynman because I think he gives perhaps the simplest hint as to why kinetic energy is important in chemical bonding. He appeals to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, shown here in blue. And then he says, if there's delocalization of electrons, so for Feynman, delocalization of electrons is the key to chemical bonding. If there's delocalization, then this quantity increases, right? Because there's a spreading out of the position of the electrons, another way of saying delocalization. Consequently, delta P, right, the uncertainty in the momentum or the error in the momentum will decrease. If delta P decreases, so will delta P squared, excuse me. And if delta P squared uh, decreases, so will kinetic energy decrease because kinetic energy is proportional to P squared. And this happens without a significant increase in potential energy. So for Feynman, delocalization of electrons is the key to chemical bonding. And the su simple argument supports the idea that delocalization results in a lowering of kinetic energy and that that's going to be responsible. Of course, it's not a full explanation yet, 
but that that's going to be responsible for chemical bonding. In many textbooks, one sees a graph of this kind labeled a molecular potential energy curve. Here it is again for the H2 molecule with the minimum in energy corresponding to the bond length of 0.74 angstroms. The only problem is that this is not a molecular potential energy curve, even though it appears as such in so many books. What it is, is a total energy curve consisting of the sum of the kinetic energy shown in red here and the potential energy shown in yellow. If it was a potential energy curve, then the bond length would be lower than 0.5 of an angstrom, which of course it isn't. It is 0.74 of an angstrom. Let's just compare it again with the textbook version that's called a molecular potential energy. No, it's not a molecular potential energy. Um, another author, Ru or Yu, the covalent bond is presented as a purely electrostatic phenomenon. Electron kinetic energy is never mentioned, even though the total energy of a molecule is the sum of kinetic and potential energy contributions. And atomic and molecular stability cannot be understood solely in terms of potential energy. He also says the amount of electron density transferred to the bonding region is greatly overstated. This is that view that it's all about the concentration of electrons between the nuclei, sometimes implying that a pair of electrons is shared in the space between the two nuclei rather than by the two nuclei. So yes, it is shared by the two nuclei, but not necessarily in that central internuclear position place. Okay, let's get a little bit more uh, precise. And I'm gonna to go to an even simpler system, the hydrogen molecule ion, the H2 plus ion, a one electron system for which there is an exact solution. There's a picture of it, nucleus A, nucleus B, electron one, which is being attracted to each of the nuclei. And then there's a repulsion term between the two nuclei. So here's the Hamiltonian consisting of the kinetic energy term, the potential energy term V, here are more details about the potential energy term. It consists of three contributions. As I was saying, the attraction of electron by nucleus A, by nucleus B, and then the one over capital R term repulsion between the nuclei. Now, it is possible by using variation theory to analyze separately the kinetic energy contribution and the potential energy contribution. I'm showing the kinetic energy, capital T for kinetic energy, in the H2 plus sign. And it turns out somewhat surprisingly that the kinetic energy in the bonding state shown in red is actually attractive, right? It turns out that's what's mainly responsible for the chemical bonding. Because if we look at the potential energy contribution in the bonding state, that turns out to be repulsive, it's positive, right? So that's not gonna, that's not gonna cause binding on its own, right? This is, this is the deeper analysis that's been carried out by the likes of Baxke and Noldholm and Rudenberg and originally Hellman. Now, when they're added together, we get, we recover the familiar picture from molecular orbital theory that the bonding orbital shown in red is more stable than the anti-bonding orbital. But these are the contributions. This is where it's coming from if one analyzes it in terms of kinetic and potential energy separately. Okay. This analysis that I've just shown you has one important shortcoming. The wave functions are oversimplified, right? They're the the sort of uh, bog standard 1s orbitals, if you like. The energetics of this analysis, right, the, the energetics of the H2 plus ion do not satisfy what is known as the Virial theorem, shown in red here. The average value of the kinetic energy divided by the average value of the potential energy should be equal to minus one half. In the case I just looked at, the values that I just looked at in the previous page, Right? If you consider these values and you do the full analysis, it turns out it's not 0.5, it's close to minus 0.4. All right, what do we do? 
Well, what one does, or what these people have done, is what's called optimal uh, orbital optimization. Consider a 1s orbital. Here's its explicit form. Ra is the distance from the nucleus, and zeta is an orbital exponent that can be varied. Right? So the optimization of orbitals is going to involve a variation in this zeta to try and find the minimum energy. Now, apologies to the non, uh, non quantum mechanics people, I'm just, or rather, for the sake of the non quantum mechanical people, I'm going to do a quick review of variation theory. We write the Schrodinger equation, time independent here, h psi equals e psi, we multiply each psi by uh, complex conjugate of psi, integrate over all space to get the second equation. E is a constant, therefore can be factored out, and we're left with equation labeled 12.48. Then what one does is one estimates or guesses a trial wave function, psi one, and the variational principle guarantees that the energy of this trial wave function can never be less than the true energy, right? E1 is greater or equal to the ground state energy. This is the variation method, and this is what's used in this form of analysis by Rudenberg and all these other people that I've mentioned. So one must do this kind of variational optimization on the orbitals in order to succeed in obeying the virial theorem. So here it is again, without optimization, when zeta is simply equal to one, as I've highlighted with that arrow there. And there are the graphs that I showed before. Bonding, and uh, in the case of kinetic energy, the top graph, bonding in the case of potential energy in the, in the lower graph. The kinetic energy is the one that is binding. When one does the opt so, and the virial theorem is not obeyed, it's minus 0.4. Following the optimization, this graph shows an increase. So there's an increase in the kinetic energy. There's a corresponding decrease in the potential energy. It turns out, for what it's worth, that the, Z, the new zeta value or the optimal zeta value is 1.24. When you run the numbers again, now the virial theorem is satisfied. We get minus 0 0.5. Okay. This optimization of orbitals, physically speaking, is equivalent to the phenomenon of orbital contraction. And this is an effect that takes place, if you like, in, in, within the process of the general process of bonding. As well as coming together, the two atoms separately experience a contraction in their orbitals. The result of this optimization is that one has a lower H2 plus energy. You get a better estimate of the energy. You get a better estimate of the bond strength. As I was saying, the virial theorem is, is now obeyed because it's now equal to minus 0 0.5. But say the proponents of the kinetic energy view, it does not help in identifying the mechanism of covalent bonding. So one of these authors puts the question like this, does orbital contraction change the mechanistic description of covalent bonding that we arrived at on the basis of just using regular 1s orbitals, where zeta equals 1? And their answer is no, it doesn't. Orbital contraction is an atomic effect whereby the optimal atomic orbitals in a molecule are tighter, right, are more contracted than in the free atom, resulting in increased electron density. So I meant to delete that part. It's, it's of no great interest. The point is orbital contraction results in the electrons in the individual atoms being closer to their parent atoms. And that's not bonding. That's not contributing to the bonding. The essential point is that the energies of orbital contraction should not be considered when trying to understand bonding since the electrons are not being shared in the contraction process. So it serves one purpose. It gives you more accuracy numerically. You, you do obey the virial theorem, but don't take it into account when trying to understand the nature of chemical bonding because it's a, it's a different thing that's going on here. 
it's in a sense the opposite of bonding. It's instead of sharing the electrons, each atom is repossessing its electrons to a certain extent, is reclaiming, is contracting its electrons. To say it otherwise, the contraction occurs as a consequence of orbital optimization. This must only be carried out in order to obey the virial theorem and to get more accuracy. But the total energy that results from the two processes of bonding and contraction should not be added together and taken to mean that the potential energy contribution is larger than the kinetic energy contribution. So according to these people, this is the mistake that has been that was made for many years and by so many textbooks. They were taking the total into account. If just bonding is considered, it is clear that kinetic energy is the more stabilizing. And once again, I reproduce those graphs. The kinetic energy is negative, right? There it is. The potential energy contribution is actually repulsive. So that's, that's the argument in favor of putting the emphasis on kinetic energy rather than potential energy as is done so on. Now, this is a work in progress on my part. Right? I, I, have a, I have my own worries, if you like, and my, my own worry is this. Why insist on bonding as only being electron sharing? Now, so this seems to be a semantic issue. Do we have to do this because bonding is supposed to be just about the sharing of electrons? But then it's almost circular, you know, because we define bonding as sharing of electrons, then we should ignore the optimization in the calculation. Surely the whole process, including the contraction, could be considered when trying to characterize bonding. And this is a question that I've been asking these experts over the last few months. Because in that case, the electrostatic view would seem to return to being perfectly valid because potential energy would be bigger than kinetic energy. The response that I've received several times now, the proponents of the kinetic energy school of chemical bonding claim that matters are not so simple. The virial theorem and orbital contraction play a supportive role, not a dominant one. In this sense, their research consists of, as it were, switching off one or other of these factors to see whether bonding still survives. What I mean by that is we can switch off the orbital contraction by using minimal basis sets of atomic orbitals with no optimization, as was done in my earlier graphs. And we saw that that still leads to chemical, chemical or covalent bonding. Right, so covalent bonding is not due to orbital contraction, is the claim. Or they artificially, if you like, switch off the virial theorem, or they don't, don't impose the virial theorem. And this is done by considering different basis sets that are not Coulombic basis sets. For instance, one can use Gaussian basis sets, Gaussian orbitals. What happens? Bonding still occurs. The virial theorem is therefore not an essential consideration. Right? It may be useful for getting more accuracy. Satisfying the virial theorem is a sufficient but not necessary condition for bonding to occur. To put it another way, if the virial theorem is obeyed, we get bonding. But if bonding occurs, that's not necessarily because the virial theorem is obeyed. OK. Now, does everybody agree with this kinetic energy view? And the answer is, of course not. Far from it. By the way, how am I doing with time? I haven't been watching the time. 46, we start. Uh, OK, I think I'm good. I, does everyone agree with all this that I've been saying? No. For instance, the late Rich, Richard Bader has this to say on this matter. In an article in Foundations of Chemistry, 2011, Bader said, I believe, and these are rather strong words, as you'll see, it, I believe in the existence of a single universe, one in which the laws of physics apply. I do not believe in the existence of parallel universes, wherein the laws are either ignored or bent to accommodate personal points of view. 
two prime examples of broadly accepted models that require the acceptance of alternative universes are, one, the argument that the kinetic energy must decrease in the energy change associated with bond formation. So he's accusing the people like Rudenberg and Baxke and Nordholm, et cetera, he's accusing them of living in a separate universe. He goes on, these models stem from neither physics nor observation, but from imaginary steps envisaged in the minds of their proponents and require a universe in which en the Enfest, Feynman and Virial theorems, in addition to the Pauli principle, are suspended. Finally, Beda also wrote that the translation of the Russian text of Hellman makes clear that any suggestion that Hellman relegated the virial theorem to a secondary position, because Hellman was the first one to point out that the virial theorem is not essential for the analysis, right? Anyone who does that uh, to a secondary position relative to any of the models that he proposed are ill-founded, right? So Bader is even challenging the claim that Hellman held this view that the virial theorem could be suspended. For Bader, the virial theorem is all important. Again, what is the virial theorem? Basically, the T equals minus one half of potential energy. This is very much sacrosanct for Richard Bader, whereas as we've seen, it's somewhat disposable in the Rudenberg school. Now, people have already talked at this conference about uh, Bader's view, q -tame. So let me let me be quite quick about this. The virial theorem was first introduced by Clausius in the context of thermodynamics back in 1870. There are certain conditions that must exist to allow us to use the virial theorem. I list three of them here. The system must be in a state of bounded equilibrium. Particles or objects concerned must interact via an inverse square law. Therefore, it's applicable to gravitationally attracted objects. That's, of course, an inverse square law. For instance, you can apply it to the solar system, and you can apply it to protons and electrons, since the Coulombic law is an inverse square law. And it is, it, another condition is that no outside forces should be acting on the system. Bader, as was described in a couple of article uh, presentations yesterday, partitions the charge density into spatial regions. There are in virial equilibrium. He's analyzing charge density through the virial theorem. Here are a couple of pictures. These partition units of charge density were originally termed by him virial fragments and later topological atoms. And I actually borrowed this diagram um, from the talk yesterday. Amazing what cut and paste can do, right? Which is the boron trifluoride. Here are the here are the edge of the atoms, according, the edges of the various, the three fluoride atoms and the boron atom. Beta extracts information from electron density rather than from wave functions. He replaces the Schrodinger equation by density functionals, or rather he's solving the, the through, uh, Schrodinger equation through density functional analysis, very much. Or, I, or rather in common with the DFT approaches. Beta is very critical of the use of orbitals and talk of overlapping orbitals. Right? For beta, they shouldn't be overlapping. For beta, atoms have definite boundaries, which he is able to characterize through his mathematical analysis. Beta talks of the quantum theory of atoms in molecules, q -tame, and he, he claims to return to a Daltonian view of atoms, atoms with hard edges, atoms as hard-shelled entities that additively contribute to the total energy of a molecule. Here is a quotation from the last paper written by Richard Bader in association with his then PhD student, Sharif Mata, who incidentally gave us a lecture in last year's meeting. Unfortunately, he's not here today. Not only do the theorems of physics, such as the virial theorem, not apply to the model of overlapping atoms, such a model does not recover the essential chemical observation regarding the characteristic properties 
exhibited by functional groups. Beda began as an organic chemist. Beda wants to recover such things as functional groups. He is claiming that the overlapping orbitals so common in quantum mechanics are misleading us. Overlapping atoms have no individual entities, but are merged with the densities of all the atoms in the system. A chemical atom, on the other hand, can exhibit near transferable behavior, even when the neighboring atoms are radically different. His atoms, he's, he's describing his own atoms, the ones with hard edges, the ones that can be transferred and so on. Now, so that's one set of disagreements. And, and it should be said that Beda's approach has been really very successful in, in quantum chemistry. There are many applications. Uh, this is not just the work of a, of a crazy man who gets overexcited and, and publishes in just inflammatory comments about his opponents. Beda's, um, it, it's quite a big cottage industry, should we say, these days, doing calculations a la Beda. A completely different objection to the kinetic energy approach comes very recently from two theoreticians, Daniel Levine, Martin Head Gordon. The title is Clarifying the Quantum Mechanical Origin of the Covalent Chemical Bond. And I apologize for all these quotations, but here goes. Lowering of the kinetic electron kinetic energy upon initial encounter of radical fragments has long been cited as the primary origin of the covalent chemical bond, based on Rudenberg's pioneering analysis of H2 plus and H2, and presumed generalization to other bonds. Their work, Levine and, and Head Gordon, considers kinetic energy changes during the formation of bigger molecules. And I've shown some examples here, CH3, and CH3 coming together, those radical fragments, F radical and F radical coming together. And it turns out these behave in the opposite way to H2 plus and H2, with kinetic energy increasing rather than decreasing on bringing the fragments together. And according to them, this requires or this demands a re-evaluation of the role of kinetic energy. So in other words, it may be good enough for H2 and H2 plus, but maybe not good enough for larger systems. I show again the slide that I showed earlier. Heitler and London's quantum mechanical explanation of the covalent bond is 95 years old. However, there is still much disagreement as to the conceptual interpretation of this theory. Perhaps philosophers of chemistry should attend to this genuine debate in understanding the nature of chemical bonding instead of withdrawing into metaphysical questions such as whether bonds exist or whether they are real. And thank you very much for listening. I hope I came in on time. I think I have. You, you, you have actually. You still have five more minutes. Do you want to make any final remarks? No? Nope. I'm, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody. So let's move to the Q&A. Questions, please. Uh, you are going to find the button of reactions, then you can raise your hand. Um, be careful of not clapping and confusing clapping with raising the hand. Uh, so questions, anybody? Oikon mm -hmm. has his hand up. Yeah, Sebastian. Yes, hi. Uh, yeah, I, since you started with your talk, I was thinking about this uh, article of Martin Head Gordon that uh, got a, a bit famous for the people working on the chemical bond. Uh, can you speak a bit more about that? Uh, because uh, everybody is speaking about uh, uh, if Rodenberg was correct, if Bader was correct, and but in this case he's saying that nobody is correct, it's strongly dependent on the system. Yeah, um, the short answer is I'm afraid I, I cannot, I have not yet had a chance, as, I'm, as I, sh I should have said, this is a very much a work in progress. 
In all my previous work, I concentrated on atoms, I concentrated on elements, I concentrated on the periodic table. This is my first serious entry into the domain of chemical bonding of molecules. So I cannot answer that question. There may be people here who can answer that question. I haven't had a chance to analyze in greater depth the work that you refer to or that I refer to of Levine and Head Gordon. So I'm presenting this as a debate. I don't know, I, I'm not yet in a position to say that one or other is any better. I don't know if I'll ever be in that position. This is, this is extremely complicated. So I'm sorry to duck the question, but uh, I don't know how the details of the Levine Head Gordon, if, if that's what the question was. Thank you. May I comment on it? Sure, Eugen. Oh, by the way, I, before you comment on it, I, I need to thank Eugen for all his assistance that he gave me in preparation for this talk and, and over the years, but especially, I, I, I apologize for not saying this earlier. Go ahead, Eugen. Uh, I can make a comment on Head Gordon's paper. Uh, <clears throat> One point is he chose very special starting states of his fragments in order to get his results. And the other point is, had Gordon tried for many years to get this paper published, and somehow there was once an option that he could escape the refereeing. <laughs> so many people uh, in the, among the bonding experts do not agree with him. Uh, I also want to add that uh, the, the paper by uh, uh, Bashkai and, uh, and Nord, uh, sorry, I forgot the name. This Nord is... This is a very reliable work, the, <clears throat> in contrast to Head Gordon's paper. And uh, <clears throat> concerning uh, the contraction, the point is uh, two overlapping atoms have an effectively higher electron negativity and contract the electron density from the farther parts of the atoms and uh, the, the atom is contracted in, in two directions, so to say. One is the electrons from outside are transferred to near the nuclei and that lowers the potential energy V. And another piece of the outside electron density is filled into the region between the atoms. There, the potential energy is not very attractive, but the wave function is made flat. And uh, the kinetic energy, the quantum mechanical kinetic energy uh, is related to the to the curvature of the wave function. And if the curvature is flat between the two nuclei, then the kinetic energy density is low. Then the whole thing can contract. And I will give a classical example. Take a, a, a balloon from rubber and press uh, air in it. So now you have uh, a, a piece of compressed air inside the balloon. Now you can extract energy from this balloon. Cool the gas in the balloon down a little. So you reduce the kinetic energy of the molecules and the gas. And the result is the pressure. Uh, on, on the balloon goes down, the balloon will contract. And at the end, uh, the temperature is higher in the balloon, 
but the volume is smaller and the pressure is has gone up. So one can make a rather simple uh, calculation of that. So uh, this phenomenon of a kinetic energy reduction is not a qu typically quantum mechanical phenomenon. It also happens in traditional um, thermodynamics. That has already been shown uh, 50 years ago by Rudenberg. Thank you. May I add something? Uh, um, yes, but we have to be quite quick because we still have four more people. Okay, uh, very quick. Uh, when you do the contraction, then the slope of the, the wave function actually grows close to the nuclei. So there the kinetic energy will have to grow. In between, it may get lower. But you have actually uh, uh, that the kinetic energy goes up. And that is a factor that we cannot remove from the system. The kinetic energy goes up when you have the bond. And then you also have the issue that uh, you see that there is a buildup of uh, electron density between the atoms when you build the bond. And that will create a lowering somehow of the uh, potential energy. I'm no, no, not the, the build up of density between the nuclei will not contribute to significant lowering of potential energy, except in very special cases, for instance, N2, as shown by Franking. Okay, thanks. So, so sorry, we have to move to the next question. So. Professor Bansik, please. Yes, uh, thank you for this excellent lecture from which I learned much. Uh, I wish to comment that uh, the reality of chemical bonds has uh, been broken already in physical organic chemistry after the theory about non-classical carbocations and other non-classical structures. And uh, the consequence of this idea of non-classical structures where two electrons are introduced in three classical chemical bonds open at a very known discussion between Herbert Brown and Paul von Schleier. So I think this idea about the question about the reality of chemical bonds origins from also from physical organic chemistry. Do you agree with this? I mean, I don't know the history exactly, but yeah. But surely also the H2 plus ion uh, is, is a prima facie challenge to the idea of the chemical bond being a, a pair of electrons. Yeah, there have been, there are many, many reasons why the chemical bond is not the way it was pictured originally by Lewis. But I, I actually, I was not aware of what you're bringing up. It's an interesting point, which I would very much like to follow up at, uh, at some stage. What year would that be? The, the, the I, I, can add, I can add a bit to that. Yeah, that, I think you might. That, that yes. controversy really isn't a controversy. Um, it even began earlier in the structure of diborane. That is two electron, three atom bonds. But... <clears throat> But, but this is just a, a red herring to the extent that modern molecular orbital theory as well as advanced valence bond theory can describe the bonding in these types of situations just as well as they can for something more classical like hydrogen, yeah. uh, dihydrogen. So th it, it, this is just an illustration that the Lewis acid, the Lewis bond uh, structures are for the simplest types of molecules that exist. Uh, when Lewis proposed those, people had no idea about diborane, let alone uh, non-classical carbo carbocations or ferrocene, and 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 so uh, as mole as more complicated molecules. Uh, became experimentally observed, 
um, modern theory had to take into consideration that new, new types of bonding. And that's been done quite adequately. So th this is not really an issue. It's, in fact, it is actually the strength of modern theory to be able to handle more and more complex molecules. Yeah. I, but uh, Jeff, Jeffrey, I, I think the questioner was was saying just that, was saying that this is a challenge to the what's been called the structural view of the chemical bond, the idea of you know, no, but, but 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 I'm what I'm saying is it is it is not a problem, but it's an advantage to have more complicated yes structures which can be cons uh, described consistently with current theory means yeah. that the current theory is actually stronger. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, now, Keith, please. Hello, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, at one point in one of the arguments, like the reference back to sharing, I must admit, I, I came over me that uh, I always lose confidence in any argument that relies on using a metaphor like sharing to actually you know, convince anybody. But there was one thing I, I didn't follow in the presentation, which might be my stupidity and ignorance, and maybe I should go and look up Feynman. You were talking about, uh, in the, um, the kinetic energy argument, about the fact that uh, if delta P had to be smaller, then delta P squared would have to be smaller. Absolutely accept that. But therefore, the kinetic energy has to be smaller. I don't understand why, why if the, 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 the error, the variation in momentum is smaller, that necessarily requires the kinetic energy to be smaller, because surely it could be just as large, but with a smaller range, you know, a well, variation. Uh, well, do you accept that the variation in kinetic energy must be smaller? Well, I mean, I, I accept from the uncertainty principle that, if, you know, if delta X gets larger, delta P must be smaller. And right. therefore, if delta P is smaller, obviously delta P all squared will be smaller, right? But that's that actually says there will be a greater a greater uncertainty in the measurement of the kinetic energy. I'm not sure why it says the kinetic energy itself will be smaller. And you don't accept that final equation there. It's a, uh, I, I I agree with that question. I agree with that point. I I think the issue is as the uncertainty in any one of those two variables gets greater and greater, the certainty of the other can in principle get smaller and smaller, but it doesn't require that the uncertainty in one makes the uncertainty in the other one direction or another. It's, that's not a requirement. It, it just is as you get more uncertain in one, you can be, you can be more certain in the other. But it doesn't mean that the kinetic energy has to go down or go up. It just means uh -huh. that the That's measurements exactly of it right. are, are closer to a central value, I think. I mean, I mean, there's probably a step there that I'm that, that, that's assumed that I'm just ignorant of, and therefore I'm missing. I'm not sure. Well, I must confess, I took this at face value from Feynman, or rather from Baxke and Nordholm's reporting of Feynman having used this argument. So I will need to go back to to that paper and uh, and maybe talk to. Baxke and Nordholm because they've they've been very helpful in explaining some of this. So thank you, thank you, Keith. Uh, very interesting, very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, Robin, and then we are going to have Mauricio. Um, Robin, please. I think he disappeared. No, Robin. While he comes back, Mauricio, can you ask your question, please? Sorry, um, that was just me. Um, uh, my iPad was doing something funny. Um, so I just wanted to, I wanted, I did want to bring up the, the point about um, the argument that was attributed to Feynman. I mean, it's, it's clearly mistaken. So um, uh, what the um, uncertainty relation gives you is a lower bound on the product of two uncertainties. So it just allows allows the momentum to get sharper if the um, uh, if there's a broadening in the value of the um, 
<coughs> of the, uh, in the broadening of the position. Um, I mean, I really wanted to say that the, the I think the second part of the talk is uh, the substance of what I'd like to say is that the second part of the talk is kind of unrelated to the to the first part. I mean, it's all very well. Sometimes scientists get wary of us talking about existence and something, but I mean, um, Paul's comment about bonding. Um, being something that um, electrons and nuclei do, it doesn't change any of the issues at all. I mean, but all that would mean is that, well, a bond coming, I mean, clearly, uh, we talk about reaction mechanisms, we talk about bonds being destroyed and created, uh, we use them explanatorily, that's what I meant um, in my discussion of the, um, uh, of the issues. So it's all very well saying that we're, going, we're not going to talk about um, metaphysical issues about existence, but in fact, we talk about them all the time. We're just not admitting that we do if we say, oh, well, we're going to talk about bonding. Um, so, uh, so for instance, um, the, the view would be that electrons and nuclei uh, bonding is something they do. Well, when they're doing that thing, bonding, and, 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 and having that phrase is no good unless we're told what the activity is. But the uh, what that activity is when um, electrons and nuclei are doing it. Well, that's when that's when there are bonds, uh, and we uh, we follow them through being created, uh, be, being created and destroyed. We have little arrows. This is um, um, a lot of the work that Mark Goodwin's been um, uh, um, uh, done on um, the development of uh, reaction mechanisms. Those are those were really useful developmentally. Uh, in understanding um, the uh, in understanding reaction mechanisms, the dynamics of reactions, um, and they develop straight out of um, Lewis's um, uh, Lewis's views. So we have a sort of a um, an interconvertibility between bonds and electrons. That yeah. um, no, now, of course, not, it, yeah. Thanks, Robin. Thanks. Um, I'm not disputing. Mm. Uh, cumulative growth of science, which you were speaking about yesterday, of course. These theories came after Lewis's, and you know, especially Pauling was was a sort of bridge between Lewis and quantum mechanics. I'm I'm am agreeing to all of that, but I still think I may be making a valid point in saying worrying about whether they're real or not doesn't get us very far. These people are making calculations; they're debating contributions from various factors. They're getting in there and actually looking at what bonding is. Philosophers of chemistry have not done that up to now. And all I'm trying to do is to say, okay, by all means, debate whether they exist or not, whether they're real or not, whatever that means, but also maybe consider this in the general debate as to the nature of chemical bonding. I'm trying to widen- I think, I mean, I think that the things, they, they sort of cut across each other because um, the, the those of you, I mean, I don't think um, I've ever really seen anyone. Um, I mean, obviously, in qualitative dis discussions of what goes on in in uh, quantum, so for, for instance, quantum mechanical explanations of bonding, uh, people sometimes talk about. Um, uh, uh, but that, that's certainly nothing like what's going on in the the the, the uh, discussion that I had with with. Um, uh, with Michael, we were just trying to sort of get to the heart of a bond uh, of, a, of a, a kind of a view, two different views of what was going on with the yes. introduction of quantum mechanics but, into. But I, said, yeah. I would, I put it to you that that debate that you and Michael were having was a debate that was done and dusted back in 1955 when people like Coulson were debating that question. That is no longer a debate among theoretical chemists. Now, the fact that it may be a debate between Robin Hendry and Michael Weisberg, yeah, it was. I, I, I was chairing that session, actually. I remember the PSA session. Uh, but that, that, that doesn't necessarily legitimize it. Well, it doesn't, well, but it, it, doesn't um, uh, it, it doesn't make a... Um, um, uh, the, the thing is, talking about it is, is as if it's about existence or reality. That's just not the issue. The, the question is whether 
as it were, structure requires you to be a commitment to um, uh, to bonds or, or not. Uh, bonds as uh, rather than a, a phenomenon of bonding and what the difference in that means. But and, and, Isaac, and, and, and we as philosophers, I think our task is to try and to get some kind of interesting qualitative issues. So yeah. as it were, looking at a straightforward bunch of calculations and um, uh, and trying to get something out of those. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. Those are a debate. I mean, it's it's yeah. Anyway, I'll I'll, I'll let it go. I think we disagree. I know. We widely can continue. Everyone. We can. Um, sorry, continue. sorry, guys. Yeah. We have three more minutes left in this slot. So, Mauricio, you have a question? Can you please? Yes, I mean, I I think I can ask my question really quickly. Uh, first of all, thanks so much, Eric. That talk was so interesting, and I'm. Uh, I'm sure that I'm going to learn a lot from it just by reflecting on, on all that has been said. I just a quick question. You say um, you, you're exploring different conceptions of the chemical bond in, in within quantum mechanics. And so this suggests to me that we're just talking about the interpretation of these and interpreting a formalism, uh, but the, they really do not have any significant empirical difference. So my question is, are there any ways to test um, empirically in the lab by means of reaction mechanisms or yields uh, of any sort, um, these different kinds of conceptions of the chemical bond? Well, a, I would have to yield to the experts, but I will say this. I mean, the beta approach is, is really quite successful. One can't dismiss what they're doing. Um, at the same time, I, I think I think maybe Eugen should be able to answer that question better than me. I I don't know, I don't know. But I but I would certainly say that both approaches have been numerically successful. But whether one, I mean, if it was as simple as that, this debate would not still be raging ninety five years later. Raging may be extreme, but you, you get the drift. <laughs> I may make a comment. Please. The problem is that one should di distinguish between energy density at different points of space and the integrated observable energy value. And uh, I had, I have a, a short write up of a simple mathematical model where there are powers of first and second order and one should uh, determine the derivative. So in principle, everyone sh should be able to follow that. And the point is it's the result of relaxation of the wave function or of the system one can do it for both a quantum mechanical molecule or for a thermodynamic system. I will just make a short write up and uh, put into this uh, discussion file that has been opened by Maria. Thank you. Thank will, you. It, will it answer Mauricio's question? That, that is there some way of adjudicating between these different approaches as a result of your write up or anybody else's can this why is this debate still continuing in other words yeah that's a good question yeah uh, so for instance beta said uh, one should only look uh, at the wave function in the stable molecule and one should not try, as Hellman or Rudenberg or Nordman and Baskai are doing, to understand intuitively why the wave function in the molecule is as it is. And yeah, due to these different standpoints, there is uh, no possibility of getting a compromise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Mauricio. I think you've uh, you've asked a very, very good question here. 
Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody. Uh